begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Father Ronan Murphy. I'm a native of uh, the city of Dublin in Ireland, born back in 1968 on the 5th of July, um, baptized uh, in the person of Jesus Christ on the 13th of July in 1968. Uh, I'm a priest of the Diocese of Camden in New Jersey, and uh, I'm over here in Australia uh, with a friend, a priest friend of mine who I studied with in seminary uh, on a year sabbatical, and so the bishop was good enough and kind enough uh, to grant me uh, a year uh, a sabbatical before I go back and resume my duties uh, in my diocese of New Jersey, Camden, New Jersey. And so just to share with you um, my journey uh, into the priesthood, um, I was uh, raised in a family of uh, five children. I have a twin brother, so there are two good-looking fellows running around the world. Um, I have uh, two other brothers and one sister, and uh, both parents are still alive, thank God, uh, back in Dublin. And so all my family uh, are living at home in Ireland. I'm the only one who's away uh, at present. And so our Lord, uh, in his providence, has taken me uh, to the shores of the United States of America to be his priest. And so, as I said, I was raised in a, a family uh, of five children. Um, I grew up uh, in Catholic Ireland in the Catholic ethos, but really the, uh, the Catholic faith uh, didn't penetrate me uh, until uh, May the 13th in 1987 when I was given, uh, by the grace of God, a spiritual uh, awakening uh, through the intercession of the Blessed and Holy Virgin Mary. After, leaving my, uh, after finishing my exams uh, in Ireland, my leaving cert, uh, I went uh, into uh, work straight away, and uh, I entered into work with American Express in Dublin City. And I was living a very uh, secularistic lifestyle. Um, I grew up uh, gifted and talented in the areas of sport, and unfortunately that became my god uh, as I grew up and I was consumed with my sport and also the partying uh, that went with it. And so really God uh, didn't uh, figure in my life, to be quite honest with you. Um, it wasn't, uh, as I said, until May the 13th in 1987 when I was walking up a busy street in Dublin City uh, called Grafton Street and uh, I was walking by a Carmelite church um, and uh, an exterior force, this is the only way I can explain it, an exterior force stopped me outside the door of that church and uh, turned me towards a jewellery shop. And as I gazed in the front window of the jewellery shop, all of a sudden all the jewellery disappeared before my very eyes and all that was left was a miraculous medal uh, in the window. And I felt so compelled to buy this medal, I bought it, I started wearing it and my whole life changed. Uh, and thus I became a, a priest as a result of this uh, mystical or spiritual experience. And uh, I was given uh, on that day when I started wearing that medal, uh, I was given uh, a special grace um, to love and devote myself to the Blessed Virgin Mary. I wanted to know everything about her. And uh, I was inspired uh, to pray the rosary. I don't think I ever prayed the rosary in my life. Um, I didn't even know how to pray the rosary. I remember my mother uh, at one stage when I was a child uh, saying a decade of the rosary at the side of my bed, but that's the only time uh, I remember saying the rosary. And so, uh, but I was inspired by the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, to pick up the rosary and to uh, learn how to pray the rosary. And also, too, I was inspired also to um, wear the brown scapular. Again, I didn't know what a brown scapular was, and so I had to... Um, uh, search uh, for uh, a brown scapular and my understanding of the brown scapular and I started wearing the brown scapular and again I was inspired to consecrate myself uh, to the Blessed Virgin Mary which I did in that Carmelite church in which uh, I experienced uh, this uh, mystical experience uh, which changed my life. And so this was the beginning of uh, my journey of faith, really, into the person of Jesus Christ. Um, I, 
Uh, all I wanted to know was everything about the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the more I came to know her and love her, the more I came to know and love her son, Jesus Christ. And the Mass uh, really made sense to me for the first time in my life. I was going to Mass uh, up to then prior to that uh, every Sunday, um, but out of habit. And I really did not know and understand uh, the true nature of the Mass, the sacrificial and the sacramental nature of the Mass. And I did not truly uh, understand that I was receiving my God in Holy Communion. And so the more I came to know and love the Blessed Virgin Mary, the more I came to know and love uh, Jesus Christ himself. And so I have always uh, had a great love and devotion to Mary since uh, this uh, uh, experience uh, back in May 13th, 1987. And so uh, I continued uh, to learn the rosary and pray the rosary, and I began to pray it every day. Uh, And the more I prayed the rosary, uh, the more uh, my faith got stronger and stronger. And uh, my understanding of the faith uh, became more, uh, uh, more profound. I had a more profound awareness of my Catholic faith. Uh, as uh, I truly believe that the rosary is a Christocentric prayer, uh, that it is a biblical prayer, and uh, an ignorance of scriptures is an ignorance of Jesus Christ. And so uh, through the intercession of Our Lady by means of her prayer, um, my ignorance of Jesus Christ was alleviated, and uh, I came to uh, a more fuller understanding of the person of Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And so I said my rosary every day. Uh, I began to go back to Mass uh, every day. I would uh, leave uh, the office on my lunch break, and I would uh, visit the church to say my prayers and to participate at Mass every day. And so uh, as the lion goes from strength to strength, my faith uh, began to grow and, uh, and strengthen. And one day I was with, uh, working in American Express, and I went to that same church uh, in, um, in Clarendon Street, in Grafton Street, just off Grafton Street. And a priest was praying uh, for those uh, immigrants uh, who um, left the shores of Ireland that they wouldn't lose their faith. And I just said a prayer to myself. It says, Lord, if I ever leave Ireland, I promise you I will never lose my faith. And I believe it was that day I went back to the office and uh, one of the general managers from England uh, was visiting and was looking for somebody to, uh, to help uh, with the computer department, the financial and computer part department over in America, sorry, over in England. And so um, they asked me would I be open to going over to England. And uh, so from that day, uh, a door opened for me to go over to England to work with American Express. And when I went over to England, um, uh, the first I knew nobody over there except this uh, general manager who I'd met in Dublin. And, uh, but I arrived uh, over in England, and the first place I went to was the Catholic Church. And uh, two Irish priests uh, welcomed me with open arms uh, into the Church of St. John the Baptist in uh, Kemp Town in Brighton. And they would see me every day at the back of the church saying my prayers. And so uh, the parish priest asked me would I uh, begin to serve uh, the Mass. And so at about uh, 20 years of age, I began to uh, serve the Mass for the first time. And uh, I just fell in love with uh, serving God at his altar. And uh, my faith, again, was uh, even uh, more so strengthened and enlivened uh, by virtue of this ministry. And I worked in American Express for two years, and uh, I felt somewhat of a call within myself that God was calling me to something more. Um, And so I left my job in England, and I went back to Ireland thinking that God was going to call me out in missionary work. And so I looked uh, around for uh, missionary work with the uh, different orders, and they were all looking for engineers and doctors and uh, uh, nurses and engineers or whatever it was, but uh, they were looking for everybody else except me. And so after six months of looking, I was getting a little bit tired and frustrated, and uh, so I um, 
asked Our Lady uh, to open a door for me. And uh, at that time, uh, the Holy Ghost Fathers contacted me and asked me would I go to Liberia uh, to assist them on the missions there. And so I told everybody I was going out to Liberia to help uh, the Holy Ghost uh, and their missionary work. And um, a month before I was meant to go over, a bloody coup started, and uh, the Holy Ghost Fathers had to flee uh, Liberia. And so the door closed in this area. And so I went before an image of Our Lady, um, of Our Lady of Good Counsel, in my parish church back home in Dublin. And I remember on my knees saying to Our Lady, says, Mother Mary, it says, I- I've done what I believe your son wanted me to do. I says, I'm looking to know his will, to do his will, and I will serve him whatever capacity. He says, but I left a good job in England, and I have no job, I have no work, I have no money coming in. I says, and my mother and father think I'm nuts. And uh, I says, please, mother, I says, I did this for your son. I says, please get me a job. And so within two weeks, um, I um, received a position in an international, um, in an international financial center uh, working for a Danish subsidiary bank. And so I landed myself in a good job. I was second in that bank in Dublin. And I worked there for two years, again, all the while praying my rosary every day, um, also um, going to Mass every, uh, every day. Um, and also praying my Divine Mercy Chaplet. And one day, after two years working for this uh, company in the International Financial Center, um, I was uh, I remember being in the Pro Cathedral in Dublin, and I still felt a calling from God, and um, I was in denial that God would call me to be a priest. And uh, like an eel in a haystack, when I was in the church for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, uh, these two priests that I met in England four years previously came up to me like a needle in a haystack out of four million people in Ireland. They came up to me in the middle of the church and said, we want to speak to you. And so, uh, let's see us after Mass. And so, after Mass, they brought me out to lunch. And uh, during my lunch with them, the younger of the two priests uh, posed a question to me. You're still thinking of it. And I knew exactly what he was speaking of. Um, he didn't mention the priesthood, but I knew that he was speaking about the priesthood. And I says, you know, Father, says, God wouldn't call me. He says, you don't know the life I've lived. Um, you know, I had a big conversion in my life. Um, and, um, you know, God wouldn't call me. He says, just try it, he said. And I said, yes, Father. And that was the first time uh, in about five years after my conversion experience, I said yes to God with regard to the calling to the priesthood. And I felt scales coming off the inside of me. I've never felt so much peace uh, in all my life. And so um, I applied uh, for um, uh, seminary through the diocese um, of Arundel and Brighton uh, over in England, and I was accepted. And uh, I, was, um, uh, I was sent to do my seminary in All Hallows uh, College in Dublin. And so there I spent uh, a year in that seminary um, in my formation. And uh, I wasn't particularly happy with the the mode of formation I was receiving. And so um, I continued to pray my prayers every every, uh, day in the seminary, uh, say my rosary. um, And I was... uh, in a sense, nearly ostracized for praying my rosary in the seminary. I remember uh, one of the formation directors calling me in and uh, saying to me, he says, you know, says, see those stones in your pocket? I says, get rid of them. He says, they're only for simple people. And I said, well, Father, says, I'm so simple, I'm nearly handicapped, so I'll keep my beads, thank you. I'll, th- I'll keep my stones, thank you. And I'll continue to say my rosary. And so I did, and uh, I was kind of uh, the odd one out um, in um, my orthodoxy. And so um, I told the bishop I wasn't too happy in the seminary. And so he asked me to take, you know, a bit of leave of absence to think about it. And uh, I said, Father says, I'm sorry that uh, I feel even uh, God's calling even stronger. And so um, I looked for um, uh, different orders to join. um, And uh, the Legionaries of Christ Um, asked me to go out to Spain and they gave me uh, about three days to decide um, you know whether I would join their order and go out to Spain and the formation was to was a duration of about uh, 12 to 14 years 
And so uh, here I was in a predicament. I had four days uh, to decide whether I was going to join this, uh, the Legionaries of Christ, um, and uh, a formation of another 12 to 14 years before I'm ordained a priest. And so I was praying and uh, praying very hard for our Lord to give me, uh, to show me where he wanted me to go. And uh, I think it was 12 midnight uh, before I was uh, meant to, the, the morning before I was meant to give an answer to the legions of Christ. And I said, Lord, it says, even at 12 midnight, I know that you can show me, uh, even now, where you want me if it's not to be the legionaries of Christ. And so after making my holy hour, I went home, and uh, my mother and uh, father had just come uh, back from visiting um, relatives down the country. And the first thing my father said to me, he says, oh, says, um, Father Michael, my brother-in-law, just called out of the blue, and uh, he asked about you, and he said, would you like to, um, to join the seminary in Wexford? And so there was my answer. There was my door open for me. I knew I was going to Wexford uh, to continue my studies, to further my studies. And so I did. Uh, I was there for uh, three years um, in my formation. And uh, again, um, uh, I continued to persevere with my orthodoxy. Um, and um, after three years, um, uh, a beautiful um, uh, door opened for me uh, into another seminary. And how that all came about was uh, I was over in um, in the Mari Movement of Priests International Senegal uh, in San Marino. And uh, a man was introduced to me uh, who had been married and uh, his wife had died. Um, and he left two children, two grown-up children behind. And uh, he felt a calling strong to the priesthood. And so he joined a new Franciscan order out in the Alps, and um, he was just introduced to me as a man from Dublin who was living in England, who had married, his wife had died, and how he joined this uh, new Franciscan order. And so I began to talk to him, and I said I would write to him. And uh, I hadn't heard from him for another year, and so I met him again at San Marino the follow following year. And uh, he was uh, this time dressed, cl clad in a religious habit. And, uh, but I could see something in his eyes. And I said, Francis, says, what's wrong with you? I says, there's something, I can see it in your eyes. And he says, is there something between you and the superior? And he says, how did you know? And I says, just uh, tell me what's going on. He says, well, you know, I've, I've been feeling this calling to the priesthood for a long time, and I've been asking this, my superior, would he allow me to study for the priesthood? And he keeps, you know, procrastinating, and it's hurting me very much. And so I said, Francis, please consecrate uh, this situation to the Blessed Virgin Mary. I promise you she will open uh, a beautiful door for you, and you will enter into the priesthood. Now, whether I was, God was prophesying through me, I don't know. Um, but I was telling him things um, that I could not have known about him. And so I promised him that if he had consecrated the situation to Our Lady, Our Lady would open a beautiful door for him uh, in order to become a priest. And so I left him and I went back to Ireland and uh, um, my bishop, the Bishop of Cloyne, um, he pulled me out of the second seminary because he wasn't happy with the second seminary and put me into a third seminary. And so I went through three seminaries in Ireland, all in God's providence. Um, and the day I entered into the third seminary, I heard that there was a monk coming from the Alps uh, in Italy and that he was going to join us. And uh, lo and behold, uh, this man called Francis, who I met in Italy twice, arrived in the door of the same seminary as I just entered. And uh, he said to me, he says, you know, you know the reason how I ended up here? He says, you sent me a letter. And he says, you sent it a year ago because the postmark was a year old on the letter. It did not arrive at my doorstep for a full year. So wherever this letter was for a whole year, I don't know. But it ended my doorstep after I left you in San Marino. And he says, and you mentioned this seminary uh, in the letter. And so I applied to the seminary, and they accepted me. And so the beautiful door that Our Lady opened for me 
she opened the exact same door for you. And so the two of us, Our Lady opened the exact same door for both of us. And so we both ended up in the seminary. And so he was uh, a bastion of strength for me uh, because I went through a, a, a trial in this seminary uh, that I will only understand in heaven. And uh, I won't go through the trial, but I was uh, persecuted within the seminary. Um, they wouldn't speak to me. The formation uh, team wouldn't speak to me. They would preach against me. Um, anyway, it's, this trial snowballed uh, into um, uh, a big trial, uh, a, a huge trial for me. And uh, in the midst of the trial, I was on my knees uh, praying asking Our Lady, please, Mother, open a new door for me and give me a sign that you're with me. And at that moment, when I asked for the sign, uh, I at seminary and uh, slid uh, an envelope, a letter under my door, uh, addressed that came from America. I'd ordered three books in the Blessed Sacrament. And so I went over and opened the letter, and there was an invoice for $50 for these uh, three books. And so I said, Mother Mary, let that be my sign. You provide me with the $50, and I know that you're with me in the midst of this trial. And so uh, that day, I went down to the local cathedral uh, to make my holy hour of adoration. And uh, when I walked into the uh, cathedral, uh, I saw a priest celebrating Mass. And I felt inspired that I was meant to speak to this priest. So to test the spirits, I said, Lord, if you want me to speak to this priest, you show me. If he comes out after Mass and he goes up in the sanctuary and he falls on his knees before you in the tabernacle, I know I'm meant to speak to this priest. And so after Mass, he went up on the sanctuary. He fell on his knees in thanksgiving and adoration before his God um, after, uh, in the Blessed Sacrament. And so after a few minutes of giving his uh, thanksgiving, he uh, got up and he walked down the aisle of the cathedral. And he stopped and he looked at me and he walked out. And so I followed suit. And I stopped him and says, Father, can, can I speak to you for a minute? And he says, yeah, go ahead. He says, you know, I don't know who you are, but I just want to introduce myself. He says, my name is Ronan Murphy. He says, I'm a seminarian uh, in St. John's uh, Seminary in Waterford. I says, can I ask you, are you a Marian priest? He says, why do you ask me that? He says, Father, are you a Marian priest? The next thing, he took his card out of his wallet, and it read, Father William A. Hodge, Atlantic City, New Jersey. And he says, turn over the card. And he was, it read he was the head of the Legion of Mary, the Marian Library, the Marian Commission, and the Worldwide Fatima Apostle. He says, is that Marian enough for you? And I says, yes, Father. This is a Marian priest. You may understand what I'm going through this trial. So I tried to explain as best I could uh, this particular trial or cross that I was bearing uh, for our Lord. And in the midst of telling him, he stopped. He stopped me and he says, let me finish your story for you. And he finished it verbatim, word for word, as I would have finished. And I says, Father, I says, how can you know what I went through? I says, I never met you before in my life. And he says, 30 years ago in America, I went through everything you went through, exactly the way you went through it. And he says, it's not a coincidence I met you today because I'm on the vocation committee for my diocese. Would you like to be a priest in America? And when he said that, I knew that a lady was opening a door for me to go to America. And so he said, come out for, um, uh, for, a so uh, for, for dinner. And I said, well, Father, I've just had my dinner. He said, well, come out for a soda. He says, what's a soda? I said, well, just come out for, you know, a 7-Up or a Fanta or something like that, or a cup of tea or coffee. And so I went to the local hotel. I spoke to him for about three or four hours um, about my journey to the priesthood and about the beautiful experiences uh, that God um, had wrought in my life uh, up to then. And um, after about three hours speaking to him, he said, you know, Ronan, says, I promise you, I don't believe it was a coincidence I met you today. He says, I want your name and address, and I says, and I'll be in touch with you. I says, I want to give you my blessing before I leave, because I have to fly back to America tomorrow. I have to see my relatives tonight. You're more than welcome to come for dinner. He says, no, Father. He says, I have to go back to the seminary. So he says, I want to give you my blessing before I leave you. So he gave me his blessing, and he says, I want to give you something else. The next thing, he took his wallet out of his back pocket, and he placed $50 exactly in my hand. 
And so that was the $50 I had asked Our Lady for. Now, the only way you can get $50 in Ireland is you, some, you go to a bank and buy that $50 or somebody from America gives you $50. Well, lo and behold, I found that somebody from America who gave me uh, that $50, and so I received my sign, and my door was open for me. And so I went back to the seminary, um, and on the way back, I heard audibly the voice of the Blessed Virgin Mary say to me, it says, Ronan, now you have your sign, and now the door has been opened for you. And so that's how I ended up in uh, Camden Diocese in New Jersey. Uh, my conversion uh, experience took place on May 13th in uh, 19, sorry, in 1987, which was the Marian year. Of course, that is the feast of Our Lady of Fatima, and it was uh, wrought through uh, the means of a miraculous medal. And so, um, 13 years to the very day, uh, I was ordained a priest on May the 13th on Saturday, which is her day. Uh, in May, her month, the 13th uh, is her day, uh, it's her number, and in the Jubilee year 2000, on the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, on the Feast of Our Lady of the Most Blessed Sacrament. And the next day uh, was actually Mother's Day, so I celebrated my first Mass in honor of my beautiful Heavenly Mother and also my, uh, my earthly mother who was with me uh, for my ordination. And so 13 has been a significant number in my own life, in my own journey, in my own spiritual life, uh, because, again, my conversion took place on the 13th. I was baptized uh, on the 13th of the month. I uh, went to America for the first time on the 13th. Um, I was 13 years to the very day I was ordained on May the 13th. And why is 13 the number attributed to the Blessed Virgin Mary? Because Esther in the Old Testament was uh, a prefigurement of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and she saved her people uh, from perishing uh, on the 13th of the month of uh, Adar. And Esther means star, and Our Lady appeared with a star on her gown, on her dress at Fatima, and she appeared on the 13th of each month as the heavenly Queen Esther in order to save her people uh, in these perilous times. And so 13 has always been a number attributed to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so um, my whole journey um, uh, of faith and my whole journey into the priesthood uh, has come uh, from Jesus through the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so that's how I anchor my priesthood on the three traditional pillars of our Catholic faith, um, on the Pope, on Our Lady, and on the Eucharist. Um, that's my motto as a priest, is omnis cum petro, a Jesus per Miriam, all with Peter to Jesus through Mary. And I believe Mary is, as uh, Holy Mother Church says, she is the mediatrix with Jesus Christ, who is the mediator, that we go to Jesus through her, that her role is to bear uh, Jesus to us and us to Jesus Christ. And Jesus' infallible role then is to bear us to the Father. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And so everything that God does is perfect. And so uh, if he chose Mary to come to us, well, then she is the most perfect and immaculate way uh, to go to Jesus Christ. And so uh, I'm a priest uh, of Jesus Christ, but I can truly say I'm a priest of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I'm a Marian priest. Uh, I love her with all my heart, and uh, I continue to pray my rosary every day. I try to be faithful uh, to my rosary. Uh, it's her predilect prayer, um, and if it's her predilect prayer, it must be the predilect prayer of her son after the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And if it's the predilect prayer of the mother, well, then it's the predilect mother, uh, the predilect prayer of her children. And so, uh, as a child of Mary, uh, and as a priest of Mary, as a priest, her priest son, I strive to be faithful uh, to that beautiful devotion called the Holy Rosary. And then, with regard to, um, uh, there was an, an episode when I was uh, back in Ireland uh, at one stage, and uh, I was going to a devotion um, to Jesus through Mary uh, in another Carmelite church. And I was on that same street that I had my conversion experience, and I was talking to a woman uh, with her child. 
and um, I was speaking about devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary when some guy came up to me and he was selling uh, scratch cards for cancer research. Obviously, he was on commission for uh, this uh, for, for, for selling these scratch cards. And uh, when he was uh, trying to sell this scratch card to me, he saw a little pin on my uh, on my shirt. And it was a pioneer pin, which is a movement in Ireland where uh, you, people choose to give up alcohol uh, for the sake of those who have alcoholic addictions. And so we make uh, an act of reparation to the, the heart of Jesus uh, for the sins against the holy virtue of temperance. And so I had taken this pledge. And when he saw this pin, he said, I can't do that. And I said, well, who's asking you to do that? And I said, no, 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 I love my drink too much. I said, well, there's a big difference in loving your drink too much and liking your drink. Hey, I used to love my Guinness. I used to like my Guinness, but I used to love my Guinness and abuse it. And I says, and, but it says, thank God, it says, I don't touch this stuff anymore. I said, but there's nothing wrong with liking a drink. It says Jesus wouldn't have changed water into wine if he had a problem with drink. It says it's a, it's a gift if we use it in moderation. And then all of a sudden he just changed the whole topic of conversation. Says, I don't need Mary to go to Jesus. Now, how he even uh, knew I was even going to a devotion called uh, to Jesus through Mary, or even this was my own uh, particular uh, devotion uh, that I tried to live. And so I said, oh, you don't need Mary to go to Jesus. And all of a sudden, all I can explain is I went into an altered state. And I came out of that altered state an hour later because uh, I, w I came out of this altered state and I saw a vast crowd, about three or 400 people surrounding us, listening to me, speaking to him about true devotion to Mary. And here was this guy in tears, crying. I don't know what I said to him in that duration. I looked at my watch. It was an hour. It felt like one minute. I says, an hour had passed by. I promise you I wasn't whisked off in a spaceship. I don't know what I said to him. But obviously I touched him because he said to me, he says, will you do me a favor? Would you pray that I have the same love and devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary? Twenty minutes later, I saw him in that Carmelite church in which I had my, uh, outside, uh, that same church outside of which I had my conversion experience. And there he was on his knees before an image of Our Lady in tears. And so hopefully uh, he grasped uh, that, uh, that truth that we should go uh, to Jesus uh, by means of Mary. And so she is the surest, the easiest, the quickest, the most perfect, the immaculate way to her son, Jesus Christ. And so Our Lady has always been uh, important in my life, um, and she has anchored my faith um, in the Church's teachings. Um, and that's why I, uh, I, my motto was omnis cum petro, all with Peter, because if you're not united with Peter, you're not united with the church. If you're not united with the church, you're not united with Jesus Christ. And so uh, I, I try to live my priesthood in fidelity uh, to the Holy Father, in, uh, and I'm a perf hopefully perfectly obedient uh, to our Holy Father because when I'm obedient to him, I'm obedient to the person of Jesus Christ, who is uh, the Pope is Christ's vicar on this earth. And also, too, my faith is anchored on the pillar of Our Lady and also the pillar of the Holy Eucharist. And these are the three pillars uh, that were um, facets of John Bosco's vision uh, pertaining to these times when he saw the bark of Peter in the midst of a great storm and he saw the Holy Father um, at the helm of uh, the bark of Peter and two uh, great pillars soaring out of the great tempest, one surmounted uh, by an image of Our Lady and the other surmounted by the Holy Eucharist and the Pope uh, anchored in the midst of this great storm uh, surrounded by uh, the church's enemies. He surrounded uh, the bark of Peter in the midst. Uh, he anchored the bark of Peter uh, in between these two great pillars uh, of Our Lady and of the Holy Eucharist. And I always believe that the Eucharist, uh, the Pope, is the bronze of our Catholic faith. Uh, our Lady is the silver of our Catholic faith. And the Eucharist is the gold of our Catholic faith. I remember a young child, uh, when I was visiting a second grade class in America, uh, she asked me, she says, uh, I was preparing them for their first Holy Communion. And uh, she said, she put up her hand and says, Father Murphy, Father Murphy, says, can I ask you a question? She says, yeah, go ahead. She says, are you a leprechaun? 
And I says, yes, I am. How did you know? He says, well, somebody told me, but, says, but leprechauns have pointy ears. You don't have pointy ears. And I says, well, I don't want anybody knowing I'm a leprechaun, so I, I wanted to lose those pointy ears when I came to America. He says, no, 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 you're too tall to be a leprechaun. Leprechauns are small. He says, well, I'm the king of the leprechauns. And he says, well, no, no, no. He says, you know, leprechauns are, cu- are, are ugly. You're cute. No, she didn't say that. But anyway, she said, if you're a leprechaun, says, where did you hide your gold? And I said, well, one thing that leprechauns don't do, and that's give away their, their secrets, especially where their gold is hidden. She put up her hand and says, I know where your gold is hidden. He says, where? She says, in the tabernacle. And so that little child truly knew who and what she was receiving in her first Holy Communion. The Eucharist, brothers and sisters, is the gold of our Catholic faith. And so I try to anchor my faith um, each day uh, with a holy hour of adoration um, before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament of the Altar. Of course, I celebrate Mass uh, every day, and I strive again to say my rosaries uh, every day. Uh, and so each day I try to um, live out that uh, spirituality of my priesthood, all with Peter to Jesus through Mary, and I try to anchor people's faith uh, on those three great pillars because if I, I believe that in these times, if you don't anchor your faith on those uh, three pillars, um, that uh, you will um, fall victim to the great apostasy of these times. And what is apostasy? The loss of the true faith. Remember St. Paul said in his letter to the Thessalonians before the second coming of Jesus Christ, the great apostasy would occur. And we are now living in these times because we are in the midst uh, of, of a great apostasy. And so uh, we, we, we are vulnerable to suffering shipwreck in our faith if we do not anchor our faith solidly on those uh, three traditional pillars of our Catholic faith. And so um, on my journey uh, to this moment in time, uh, God has given me uh, many beautiful, uh, uh, mystical, spiritual experiences. Um, I I see the hand of God in my life. Um, um, I I, I totally and truly believe in God's uh, divine providence. And um, he has looked after me. Uh, in in every aspect uh, of my priesthood. And so uh, I just trust in him. Um, I trust uh, in his divine mercy. Uh, I also have a particular vo- devotion to the divine mercy of Jesus. Uh, my One of my favorite feasts uh, as a priest is the Feast of Divine Mercy. And um, in my own particular parish, just which I just finished uh, five years in St. Peter's in Merchantville, um, uh, seating capacity of about uh, 12 to 1300 people. The church will be packed uh, every Divine Mercy Sunday uh, that I would celebrate. And, um, and so uh, I believe this feast is very, very important. As our Lord said to St. Faustina, I'm giving humanity the last um, uh, opportunity uh, of salvation. I'm giving them the feast of my Divine Mercy. If they do not choose my mercy, they shall choose my justice. And so he's offering us this gift of salvation and the feast of divine mercy, which is the great gift of divine mercy, uh, and that gift is uh, basically a second baptism. What a gift that Jesus Christ promises that those who uh, go to confession uh, in the state of grace receive him with great trust on that day in Holy Communion, that they will receive uh, the full remission of their sins and all punishment due to their sins which is really uh, the gift of a second baptism. And so where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And so I try to um, promote this devotion of divine mercy, especially I promote uh, that uh, sacrament uh, that God has given us, so graciously given us, called the sacrament of confession for the forgiveness of sins after baptism. And so this sacrament is important not only in my own priesthood. I try to go to confession at least uh, uh, every week um, or every second week. Um, But I try to promote uh, that sacrament amongst our own Catholics, uh, those entrusted to me, and all those who I meet. You know, that sacrament really is the thermometer of the Church. And uh, it shows how healthy or how unhealthy she is at this present time. And, um, you know, so many souls are not availing of of this great sacrament. So many people commit sin and justify their sin 
and no longer confess their sin and placing themselves in, in, in perilous danger of being lost for all eternity. And so God is, is waiting with open arms uh, for, uh, for us to come back and to say we're sorry. Uh, God is faithful when he said the sins that you forgive, they are forgiven. The sins that you retain, they are retained. And it's a beautiful um, uh, facet of my priesthood is to be able to absolve souls uh, in that sacrament. And so uh, I try to, be, um, try to be in that sacrament uh, as often as I can, uh, available um, for souls uh, and to reconcile them with God and with others and with ourselves. And so to give them that beautiful peace that Jesus attached to that sacrament when he said, peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit, the sins that you forgive, they are forgiven. And so peace is attached to that sacrament. Why? Because sin destroys our peace. It destroys our relationship with God, with others, and with ourselves. What does confession do? It reconciles you and your relationship with God, with others, and with yourself. And so it is a sacrament of peace. And peace uh, is necessary in our times. You know, it's necessary always, of course, but there's a great crisis of peace in the world. Um, and peace must begin with ourselves before we start working on the rest of the world. And so uh, there's a hymn that we sing um, in, in the church, let peace uh, be on earth, but let it begin with me. And so it must start with ourselves. And so anybody watching this video, um, I hope that you will um, you know, receive that grace uh, to go back to confession uh, if you need to go to confession right now at this moment in time. Jesus loves you uh, and he's willing to forgive you and no matter what sins you've committed, Jesus can forgive all sins. And so he's waiting even for the greatest sinners uh, to come back, especially the greatest sinners. As Jesus said, the greater the sinner, the greater the right he has to my divine mercy. Another beautiful facet of my priesthood is um, also um, the anointing of the sick, um, tending to the sick and to the dying. And I've had many beautiful experiences um, with the, the sick and the dying. I've seen uh, God miraculously heal people uh, through that sacrament that I've administered. And so, again, it's not me. It's uh, the person of Jesus Christ who's doing the healing. Uh, and I've also seen Jesus administer his mercy and his grace uh, to souls before they uh, leave to make this great leap from time into eternity. And so uh, one particular uh, story I will share. Um, last year I was um, called out by a parishioner and um, to tend to his mother-in-law. When I was in the car uh, driving, I, was, uh, I got an inspiration um, that this woman had never been baptized. So when I arrived at the house, um, got there by the help of these wonderful, this wonderful technology called the navigational system, even though uh, in America I'm the only one who has a navigational system with a lisp, uh, she... Uh, the navigation says you're entering the Atlantic City Expressway. But anyway, I said, I can't help that. But she got me there anyway to the house. Uh, and I arrived uh, at the house, and the man was waiting for me. And I said, you know, was your mother-in-law ever uh, baptized? And he says, I don't know. And so I go into the house, and the woman was in a coma. Uh, she was on hospice, and she had been comatose um, for uh, a duration. And there was the daughter at the end of her bed, and the grandchildren surrounding uh, the uh, hospice bed of their grandmother. And I said to the daughter, I says, you know, was your mother ever baptized? I said, baptized, what does that mean? And so it was indicative that this woman had never been baptized. And so I just said a little prayer in my heart. I said, Lord, you know, all the prayers that I can say here tonight are not going to get her into the kingdom of heaven if she's not baptized. You clearly said, it says, unless you are baptized, born of water and the Holy Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And at that... I saw, and I literally saw, and I was the only one in the room who saw this, I saw the woman's soul come out of her body. She sat up, there was her body on the bed, and there was her soul sitting up, looking directly into my eyes. And so she looked into my eyes for about 30 seconds, 
And I kept looking at her, and she kept looking at me. And then she went, her soul went right back into her body. And people have asked me, says, what does the soul look like? It had the same form as the body. But I could see her body lying in the bed, still comatose, and yet her soul was alive, just looking right into my, into my eyes. And so uh, I held her hand, and um, she, uh, I said to her, I says, you don't know who I am, but Jesus loves you, and Jesus is here for you. I says, if you can hear me, I says, are you, are you sorry for all the sins that you've ever committed? If you can hear me, squeeze my hand. And everybody saw her squeeze my hand, and everybody gave out a gasp. <gasps> they hadn't seen her, you know, make any movement for uh, a duration because she had been comatose for a, for a while. And so I said to her again, I says, do you want Jesus to forgive you all your sins? And again, she squeezed my hand. And everybody in the room saw her squeeze my hand. I says, quick, get me the water. So I proceeded to baptize her. And I baptized her. I said the prayers of the dying over her. And she died. Well, the following morning, I uh, went back. I was in my rectory. And uh, there was, uh, we have three secretaries. We have a fairly, uh, a fairly large parish. Uh, St. Peter's in Merchantville is a very large parish. And so we have three secretaries, wonderful secretaries. And they asked me, says, I heard you got called out in an emergency last night. I says, yeah. I says, oh, who did you go and see? So I told him, says, oh, we know her. I says, she, I says, she's a Jew. I says, not anymore. She's a Catholic for all eternity. Christ be beside me. Christ be before me, Christ be behind me, King of my heart. Christ be within me, Christ be below me, Christ be above me, never to Christ on my right hand, Christ on my left hand, Christ all around me, shield in the strife, Christ in my sleeping, Christ in my sitting, Christ in my rising. Light of my life, Christ be in all hearts, thinking about me, Christ be in all tongues, telling of me, Christ be the vision in eyes that see me, in ears that hear me, Christ ever.